Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Lucille True, and I'm a licensed national um, park guide. I want to welcome you here on behalf of the city of Vicksburg. It is always a pleasure to have such a nice group visit our city, and I hope you will enjoy every moment of the tour. Please don't hesitate to ask questions. If I can't answer them, and if they are of, of real importance to you, I will be happy to refer them to one of the park historians. As you know, Vicksburg is an old city steeped with history. The Spaniards explored, uh, in exploring the Mississippi River, built a fort here in the middle 1700s, which they named uh, Fort Nogales. And Nogales in Spanish uh, means a walnut. And that was Vicksburg's first name, a walnut hills. But between 1810 and 1812, a Methodist minister by the name of Reverend Newt Vick migrated to Vicksburg from Virginia with his family. He and Mrs. Vic were the parents of 13 children, and he built beautiful homes for his children, and only one is standing in Vicksburg today. Aside from being a minister, he was also a surveyor, and he surveyed uh, the little town of Walnut Hills. Uh, the Reverend Vic and Mrs. Vic uh, died on the same day during a yellow fever epidemic. And the people of the little town of Walnut Hills held him in such high esteem and respect that they changed the name of Walnut Hills to Vicksburg. Vicksburg's historical significance is mainly due uh, to its strategic position on the Mississippi River during the war between the states. The Union forces wanted control of the Mississippi because in doing so, they could split the Confederacy and Union troops would have free access uh, to the river. President Lincoln remarked that Vicksburg was the key, and until he had that key in his pocket, uh, the war would not be brought to a successful conclusion. To protect this vital lifeline, the Confederates had built fortifications at important points along the river, and Union forces fought their way southward uh, from Illinois and northward from the Gulf of Mexico. Early in the spring of 1862, Admiral Farragut of the Union Navy made his way to Vicksburg. This was after he had taken the port south of Vicksburg, New Orleans, Baton Rouge, and Natchez. In fact, uh, the Union forces had control of everything by then but Vicksburg and Fort Hudson. Farragut came with a large fleet, but Vicksburg was ready. They had batteries all along the riverfront. And, and when Farragut would fire on Vicksburg, they would fire back on his fleet. He wasn't making much progress, and when he got into Vicksburg, the water was high, and as it began to recede, he was afraid he couldn't get out. So he left and went back to New, New Orleans and notified the proper authorities that in his opinion, Vicksburg would never be taken from the river. It was then that General Ulysses S. Grant in October 1862 was appointed commander of the Army of the Tennessee and charged uh, with clearing the Mississippi of Confederate control. At the same time, General Lieutenant General John C. Pemberton a West Point graduate and a Pennsylvanian by birth, was appointed to keep the river open and to defend Vicksburg. Incidentally, 
Pemberton had known Jefferson Davis at West Point, and they had fought together in a previous war. And when Davis knew Vicksburg was in trouble, he wanted Pemberton to defend it. Jefferson Davis and Joe Davis were large uh, landowners and cotton planters in Warren County. Jefferson Davis was living at Bryfield on Palmyra Island, 27 miles south of Vicksburg, when he was asked to accept the presidency of the Confederacy. Davis was re reluctant to accept the post because uh, he <clears throat> was a soldier and he wanted to fight for the South. After General Grant's appointment, he and General Sherman moved toward the South. Grant came by land and sent Sherman by the Mississippi River. When Grant got into northern Mississippi in a small southern town known as Grenada, the Confederates under Captain Van Dorn burned Grant's supply base at Holly Springs, Mississippi. This was a loss to Grant of over a million dollars, and without his supplies, he was forced to, turn, forced to turn back and failed in his attempt. A Sherman got six miles north of Vicksburg at a place known as Chickasaw Bayou. And he actually had the first encounter here with Confederate troops. But this, was a, an, this encounter was a failure. It was a battle of confusion as neither side uh, knew what to do. When Sherman saw the large number of Confederates, he turned back and his attempt failed. Then in the late winter of 1862, Grant and Sherman made their way back on the Louisiana side, west of Vicksburg and west of the Mississippi River. Here he attempted a series of amphibious operations known as the Bayou Expeditions. But the winter was poor, his engineering equipment was bad, and the roads were impassable. So he failed again to get into Vicksburg. Then Grant had the bright idea of bypassing Vicksburg. With the help of Admiral David Porter of the Union Navy, Porter got Grant supplies by the Vicksburg batteries uh, late one evening, and Union troops <clears throat> marched through the Louisiana marshes 30 miles south of Vicksburg or near Grand Gulf. When Porter's gunboats <clears throat> bombarded Grand Gulf, Grant moved a little further south to Brunsburg, where Porter ferried them over on the Mississippi side. Grant fought his first battle at Port Gibson, Mississippi, where he met Confederate forces under the command of General John Boyne. But Boyne was outnumbered <clears throat> and defeated. Boyne later was placed in command of a northern portion of the Confederate line here at Vicksburg as one of General Pemberton's uh, subordinate officers. After the battle at Port Gibson, everyone thought Grant would turn due north to Vicksburg, but he had learned from a Union spy that there were other Confederate forces trying to get into Vicksburg to reinforce Pemberton, and they were all coming uh, from the east. Grant then turned northeasterly, and at Raymond, Mississippi, he met General John Gray. <clears throat> He defeated Gregg and then moved on toward Jackson. There he met General Joseph E. Johnston, Pemberton's superior in the Confederate Army. After defeating Johnston, <clears throat> Grant turned westward to Vicksburg, and Johnson went further into central Mississippi and notified Richmond it was too late to save Vicksburg. Meanwhile, Pemberton, who was waiting for reinforcements that never came, 
left the large defense line he had built here at Vicksburg and went east to meet reinforcements. At Champion Hill, 16 miles east of Vicksburg, Pemberton met Grant coming westward, and this was the, bat the bloodiest battle of the Vicksburg campaign. <clears throat> Grant, uh, Pemberton saw Grant's huge army, and uh, he turned back to Vicksburg, but Grant followed him. A big black river, Pemberton burned the bridge spanning the river, hoping uh, to stall the Union troops. But an improvised bridge was quickly built, and another skirmish ensued. Pemberton then rushed back to hold the line at Vicksburg, with the Union Army following. And on May the 19th, Grant had arrived and was knocking at the Vicksburg door. On this same day, he assaulted the large stockade redan, a strong Confederate fortification mean midway on the Confederate line. Grant thought that the Confederates were discouraged after the battle at Big Black and Champion Hill, and he would take over immediately. <clears throat> but to his surprise, uh, they were unable to take the stockade uh, Redan. Grant was astounded at his losses at the end of that day. But on May the 22nd, he made another assault all along the Confederate lines, but again he failed. Still more discouraged and frightened over the many casualties, he settled down to siege warfare and he fired on Vicksburg uh, for 47 days. Meanwhile, the Union Navy was bombarding Vicksburg from the river, which they soon controlled. With Grant surrounding the entire eastern part of Vicksburg and the Union Navy in control of the river, a blockade was formed. With the old Southern Railroad uh, cut off, uh, they were unable to get food, ammunition, and medical supplies into Vicksburg. Pemberton remarked that although he had 18,000 Confederate soldiers to defend Vicksburg, toward the end, he had only 18,000 who were able to fight. The rest uh, were sick and hungry. Pemberton had called a council of his subordinate officers and they too were of the opinion that it was time to give up because, the condition, uh, because of the condition of the men. But on July the 3rd, according to a story written about the fall of Vicksburg, General Pemberton received a note uh, written by a young Confederate officer in which he told the general that they were getting only two mouthfuls of bacon and a small biscuit a day. And he closed his note by saying, if you can't feed us, you had better surrender us. <clears throat> Pemberton was touched uh, by the young officer's note and immediately sat down at his desk and wrote Grant to meet him at a designated place to discuss the surrender terms. When they met, uh, Pemberton had certain requests he wanted Grant to fulfill, but Grant was very adamant and demanded unconditional surrender. Pemberton's uh, requests were concerning parole and other te technical matters, but one thing he was asking was that when he marched his men out of the lines at Vicksburg and they stacked their guns, he asked Grant to have his men go in quietly and not offend or disturb the citizens of Vicksburg. But Grant was still noncommittal, and Pemberton made a motion to get up and leave. Then Grant suggested that maybe it could be settled in writing. The next day was Independence Day, the 4th of July, and Grant's men were in a holiday mood, and they were tired of fighting too. 
This changed Grant's attitude, and he agreed to some of Pemberton's requests. The writer went on to state that as the Union soldiers marched into the city, they went in very quietly, and when they were hoisting the flag on the old courthouse lawn, one Union soldier I broke the silence and said, let's get, all give three cheers to the gallant defenders of Vicksburg. And the writer went on further to state that this was a striking example of the fact that those young men were not fighting each other, but were fighting for their principles and for what each side I thought was right. When Port Hudson surrendered five days after the fall of Vicksburg, uh, the opening of the Mississippi River and the fall of the Confederacy was at last realized. As President Lincoln uh, then said, the great Mississippi River again goes unvexed to the sea. The military operations employed by General Grant in the capture and fall of Vicksburg stand out in history as among the most remarkable on record. Grant made his reputation at Vicksburg and was later appointed Commander-in-Chief of the Army of the United States. As previously stated, General Pemberton was not a Southerner but had married a girl from Virginia and had lived, been living in the South for many years. And when the war broke out, his sympathies uh, were with the South. So he joined the Confederate forces. When he surrendered Vicksburg, historians began to criticize him, stating that had he been a true Southerner, he would never have given up so easily. This criticism, however, was later retracted as it was felt that no one could have done better with the odds Pemberton had against him here in Vicksburg. He was genteel by nature, and his greatest problem in defending Vicksburg was that he was receiving conflicting orders. President Davis was ordering him to do one thing, and General Joseph Johnston another. We will now proceed uh, with the tour of the Vicksburg National Military Battlefield. Uh, the battlefield at Vicksburg was established as a national landmark in 1899. This was over 30 years after the battle and siege of Vicksburg. General T.C. Catchins, a national representative from Mississippi and a resident of Vicksburg, along with General Stephen Dale Lee, the Confederate general who had fought here, and General Everest uh, from Illinois, were instrumental in bringing this about. When its restoration began, it has been said that after this interim period of over 30 years of neglect, in which weeds and brush had covered the battlefield, they could still go back and find the large forts, trenches, and other earthworks almost as it had been left after the fall of the city. Its good preservation is due uh, to the nature of the soil here, known as Lois, L-O-E-S-S. -S. This soil isn't in many places in the world. It's found along the banks of the Nile in Egypt, some portions of China, and all along of the Mississippi Delta. It was a heavy dust that was blown in thousands and thousands of years ago, and it doesn't erode easily. The soil, along with the diligent efforts on the part of the Department of Interior, to keep it intact, has given it the reputation of being the best preserved battlefield in the world today. It is also considered one of the most accurately marked off battlefields. 
and this is largely due to one man, a Captain Rigby from Iowa, who, as a young man, 22 years of age, fought here with the state of Iowa. Rigby was later appointed the first superintendent of the National Cemetery here, and he and his wife are buried there. The battlefield comprises a large area, approximately 1,800 acres. There are 33 miles of paved roadway, and our tour will cover about 16 miles. When it was first made a national landmark, it was under the Department of War, but in the 1930s was turned over to the Department of Interior, and they do an outstanding job in preservation and keeping the grass cut. In some places you would notice it looks like a golf course. Each morning a crew of workmen is sent out to pick up any litter that was dropped the day before. As we begin our tour of the battlefield, let us take in a portion of the southern end first. <clears throat> let me call to your attention that the roads are built on the lines the two sides have. They, they are two irregular, irregular ridges encircling the whole eastern part of Vicksburg from the north to the south. Pemberton, who was here seven months before Grant made his assault, selected the inner ridge to hold Vicksburg. And when Grant got here, he took the lower ridge to make his assault. Today, the inner ridge is known as Confederate Avenue and the lower ridge as Union Avenue. As we begin, the large crescent mound you see in front of us is known as the second Texas lunette. As its name implies, it is shaped like a it is shaped like a half moon and occupied by troops from Texas. As you go under this underpass, notice the Union approach made to the second of Texas lunette. You now see the bed of the old Southern Railroad, which is still used by Illinois Central today. The Old Southern was bringing supplies to the Confederacy here from Texas, Louisiana, and Arkansas, the Confederate states west of the Mississippi. As we enter the southern portion of the battlefield, I would like to call your attention to the blue and red markers. Blue markers represent a Union positions and red markers the Confederate position. To your right is the railroad redoubt built to protect the old Southern Railroad. This fort also was held by Texans in the assault of May the 22nd. At that time, our troops from Iowa breached the railroad redoubt. They went in and they were taking Confederate soldiers out as prisoners when troops from Texas came in and held it. The beautiful monument that you see on the railroad redoubt is a memorial to the sex soldiers from Texas because they fought so bravely and valiantly to hold this fort. The guns you see along the lines are the originals used here during the campaign in Siege of Vicksburg. The carriages have been replaced from time to time, but the barrels are the originals and some are placed in their original position. Next, you see Alabama's beautiful memorial, erected and dedicated in recent years. Here, the bronze soldiers have their trouser legs tied at the ankle with ropes. This was a common practice as the bugs and the insects were unbearable here, and they did this to keep them from crawling up their legs, and jokingly said they kept their trouser legs tied until they got so dirty the bugs wouldn't bite them anymore. You now see Square Fort, 
the best preserved fortification on the Confederate line. This fort is sometimes called Garrett's Fort because Brigadier General Isham Garrett was in command and he was shot here. Along our tour, we see approximately 1,800 markers consisting of memorials, res res regimental markers, emplacement markers, and statues, busts, and bronze relief portraits of many officers who fought here. Leaving Garrett's Fort, we enter the Union line on which we will ride for quite some time. Please note the zigzag trench that you see at, uh, as on your left. This trench is known as Hovey's approach to Garrett's Fort. General Alvin Hovey was from Indiana and was trying to mine uh, Fort Garrett. He directed that this trench be dug in a zigzag style. So if the shells from the fort were to fall into the trench, they'd roll to a corner instead of straight through. And in that way, there wouldn't be as many injuries and casualties. Regimental monuments along the lines are placed uh, where that state's troops were seeing action on the battlefield. If you note here, you see an Indiana a regimental monument. Now we see the beautiful Iowa Memorial. It is one of the most, uh, and it's considered the most artistic on the battlefield. The six beautiful bronze plaques represent each of Grant's battles and his first assault on Vicksburg on May the 19th. This outstanding bronze work, which is considered some of the finest in the United States, was done by Henry H. Kitson and his wife, Theo Ruggles Kitson. I mention this because uh, they were considered two of the foremost sculptors around the turn of the century. And Mrs. Kitson has done 75 pieces of bronze work on the Vicksburg battlefield. They were here in 1908 during this work, and my mother has told me uh, that the local papers then printed many accounts of the Kitson's works uh, while they were here. Now, as we leave the southern end, uh, you see many statues and busts of numerous uh, Union officers, most of them active at the assault on the railroad redoubt. Here you see General McClernand on the horse. He was from Illinois. General Edward Ard from California. General Lawler from Iowa. And General Eugene Carr from Illinois. Now we are passing the visitor center. This building was built low with earthwork built around it to give it the appearance of a fortification. And incidentally, the earthwork around the visitor center and the gun emplacements as you enter the battlefield are the only artificial earthworks on the Vicksburg battlefield. All the rest of the earthwork you see is the earthwork that was built before and during the siege of Vicksburg. The beautiful archway you are now approaching is placed at the northern entrance of the Union line. It was first placed at the entrance of Vicksburg, but later removed because it was too narrow for modern day vehicles. It was built with funds that had been appropriated for the entertainment of the old soldiers and is, and, in and is dedicated to the memory of the northern and southern soldiers engaged in the campaign and siege of Vicksburg. Now, here at this intersection of Union Avenue is what is known as Pemberton's Avenue, and it connects the two night lines. On Pemberton Avenue, uh, General Grant and General Pemberton met to discuss uh, the surrender terms. They sat under a large oak tree, which is now designated by a white shaft with a ball on top. 
We are now approaching uh, Battery de Gallia. This is the largest battery on the battlefield. Named for uh, a Michigan general, de Gallia, who was shot here. From here, the Union field guns, you see, hammered the great redoubt, which you see in the distance on the Confederate line. The tall white shaft placed on the uh, great uh, redoubt is Louisiana's memorial to her soldiers. They, are like the Texans, held the great redoubt in the assault of May 22nd. We now approach uh, the Shirley House. This is the only structure on the... Before we turn over the other one. They supposed to got on the po little porch that you see on top of the roof and waved the American flag to the Union soldiers. And she was trying to convey the message to them that she wasn't a Southerner and pleading with them not to destroy her home. Now you see the beautiful Illinois Memorial, patterned after the Roman Temple of Pantheon. It is the largest and most costly of the state memorials. When it was unveiled here in 1906, it cost approximately $140,000. Today, it would cost millions. A great deal of thought was put into its designing. There are 47 steps are leading to its doorway, each step representing a day of the siege of Vicksburg. There are bronze tablets inside with the names of the 36,000 men who fought here of Illinois inscribed in bronze. Above the doorway, we have the carved likenesses of President Lincoln, General Grant, and Governor Yates, Illinois' wartime governor. Above the beautiful camp, uh, columns, you will see uh, three women. One woman represents the North, one the South, and the one in the middle represents history. She's holding a scroll in her lap. <clears throat> Nearby is the third Louisiana Redan, another large a southern a stronghold, where the two sides were fighting eye to eye. A big mind explosion took place here at the third Louisiana Redan. 2,200 pounds of, explosion, of powder uh, was, were exploded by the Union troops. When this explosion went off, the Confederates ran down the hill, and the Union uh, troops thought they had captured uh, this big fortification. But when the smoke all died down, the Confederates came back and held the fort. We are now <clears throat> winding our way uh, through many co uh, curves. And I've been told that if you can view the battlefield from a hel helicopter, these curves that we are riding through uh, <clears throat> seem to be farming of the letters U.S. for United States on the Union line. Now here at the top of the hill, for some years there was a path known as Ransom's Gun Path, where heavy artillery was dragged over rough terrain only a hundred yards from the Confederates. General Ransom <clears throat> was from Illinois and he was one of the Union officers who almost broke through the Confederate line. But bear in mind that the Confederate lines in Vicksburg were never broken. It was the blockade that caused the fall. Now you see the beautiful Wisconsin Memorial. It is very stately and imposing. The bronze work on either side is considered very good. The bronze eagle at the top of the shaft uh, represents a real live eagle who was here during the siege. The story about the eagle is that he was bought by a young Wisconsin farmer from an Indian for several bushels of corn. Then the young farmer became a volunteer in the Wisconsin troops and was sent to Vicksburg and brought the eagle with him. The other boys became attached to the old bird too and they called him their mascot and named him Old Dave for President Lincoln. So that's Old Dave on top of the uh, shaft 
of the Wisconsin Memorial. We are now approaching a very significant area on the Union line. Here is where General Grant made his first assault on May the 19th. In the far distance, we see the stockade redan on the Confederate line. The large, uh, southern, uh, a large southern uh, fortification. I would like to uh, pause here and tell you that a redan is a triangular shaped a fort, and this fort still retains its shape. Uh, also, note the, uh, the Union Battery Jenny lined up in front of the fort. The high road you see in front of us is known as Graveyard Road, and it's very important historically because Union troops marched through the Graveyard Road into Vicksburg following the fall of the city. It also designates a Ewing's approach to the stockade Redan. Ewing and Buckland, two Union officers, uh, made two approaches uh, to this fort. They placed flags at the base of the fort, but were never able to take over. As we ride on, we are approaching Grant's headquarters, one of the most picturesque areas on the battlefield. There were some eastern states engaged in the uh, uh, campaign and siege of Vicksburg, but they were never called to the lines. Some were still east of Jackson, and some were in Louisiana. And when this was made a national landmark, these states uh, wanted a recognition. So their beautiful memorials are placed in Grant's headquarters. First, we see Rhode Island, uh, the a soldier carrying the tattered flag. Next is New York, very plain but classical in appearance. And the bronze relief portraits that you see here on the right were officers on General Grant's staff. Now you see Massachusetts, the handsome soldier mounted on a boulder that came from Massachusetts. And Massachusetts was the first state to unveil a memorial on the Vicksburg battlefield. Now <clears throat> we see Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania has a beautiful setting and a beautiful inscription inscribed thereon. It states that here brothers fought for their principles and here heroes died for their country, and a united people will forever cherish the legacy of their noble manhood. Now this is General Grant on his horse named Egypt. His memorial is erected on his tent site. On that mound he had a large tent with a wooden floor, and Mrs. Grant visited him here in Vicksburg and also his young son, Fred. It has been said that the general stood on that mound and looked toward Vicksburg and remarked that Vicksburg would make him or break him. If he didn't take it, he'd be a forgotten man. <clears throat> the blue tablets that you see along the lines here uh, give us uh, d detailed accounts of his five battles his two assaults of May the 19th and May the 22nd, and his siege of, on Vicksburg. And the last tablet is, uh, contains statistical information, giving the number of killed, wounded, and missing on the two sides. We are now approaching a Thayer's uh, approach. And here we are under the only tunnel uh, remaining on the battlefield. Thayer's troops stormed up to the Confederate line and were repulsed with heavy losses ensuing. They then built a tunnel to protect themselves when crossing uh, the open ridge. Now you see the beautiful naval, uh, Union Naval Memorial, pat patterned after the Washington Monument on a smaller scale. At its base are four bronze figures they are the Union naval officers who helped Grant take Vicksburg, namely Farragut, Porter, Davis, and Foote. General Grant said had it not been for the Union Navy, he could never have taken Vicksburg. On the right is the bust of Commander Selfridge, 
Selfridge was commander of the gunboat Cairo, uh, which you will see at the foot of the hill. The Cairo, uh, with its commander and crew, was going north of the Yazoo uh, River when it struck two Confederate mines. The gunboat sank in 12 minutes. There were 175 men aboard, but no casualties. As time passed, people lost sight of where the ship had sunk, and it remained in the, in the bed of the Yazoo River for 102 years. It was found in the 50s by historian Ed Boris and later removed uh, from its waterbed. It has now been restored with all of its parts that they were able to salvage, and its artifacts are housed in the museum adjoining the restored gunboat. To the west is the National Cemetery, uh, where 17,000 Union soldiers are buried, 13,000 being unknown. At one time, the Vicksburg National Cemetery had the reputation of being one of the most beautifully landscaped spots in the country. I don't believe it has that, still has that a reputation. There are no Confederate soldiers are buried in national cemeteries because one of the requirements is that you have to fight under the American flag and our Confederates are re rebels. The Confederate by, uh, uh, heroes who died here in the campaign in siege of Vicksburg, whose bodies were not claimed, are buried in our city a cemetery. And of course, there are Confederate cemeteries all over of the South. Um, I understand, though, that there is one Confederate uh, from Arkansas and one from Texas buried in this cemetery uh, through Aaron. The small uh, square markers that you see are the unknown, and those who are known uh, have their name, their, the state they were representing, and a number on their marker. Uh, the reason uh, for the great number of unknown Union soldiers was due to the fact that as these Union heroes began falling on the southern battlefields, they tried to ship their bodies home. But in that day, we had lost the art of embalming, and by the time the body reached home, it had come, become decomposed. The railroad was getting so many complaints, they refused to take them, and then they had to bury them in uh, trenches and um, on the, in, pla uh, in places where they had fallen. <clears throat> and that, that another reason was that they, they, although they did have play, uh, markers, they wore them on their coat, and it was so fight, hot in the South uh, that they were fighting in their shirt sleeves. As we continue through Connecting Avenue, we are now at Fort Nogales, the strong fortification built to protect the city uh, from the North. This is the same site where the Spanish explorers built their fort, known as Fort uh, no Nogales. Now you are overlooking the Yazoo uh, Canal here at Vicksburg. The, the Mississippi River changed its course here 13 years after the siege of Vicksburg. This was disastrous for Vicksburg. It was a river town and it carried on its trade, all its trade on the river. Memphis gradually got the cotton business and Jackson the railroad and Vicksburg stood still. But in 1902, uh, we were able to afford to have engineers channel the waters from the Yazoo R River uh, north of Vicksburg into the old bed of the Mississippi River. And we now have a two and a half mile diversion canal in front of the city of Vicksburg, and we are a river town again. My maternal grandparents were living here during the battle and siege of Vicksburg. My grandmother was eight, and she remembered that in the summer, after the ch change of the river, that there was such a small stream running through its old bed uh, that you could jump over it in the summer months. Uh, my grandfather uh, has told us stories about going into the uh, Confederate camps here 
at Vicksburg and seeing the Confederate soldiers eating mule meat. They told him it was very palatable and tasted like tough beef, but that was because they were so hungry. We are now on the Confederate line again, where Mississippi, Tennessee, and Louisiana troops were holding of the line. We are now passing of the Stockade Redan, where Grant made his first assault. Notice, note the beautiful uh, Missouri Memorial at this point. This is a very a lovely a piece of work. <clears throat> the bronze work on the north side of the Missouri Memorial depicts the northern Missouri making the assault on Vicksburg, and on the south side is the uh, southern, the Confederate Missouri uh, defending it. Uh, Missouri was divided here. She had 25 commands representing the northern cause and 15 the southern cause. And it was a very tragic uh, situation for the Missourians because during the day, uh, they would often recognize friends and relatives. But in the, uh, in the evening, as this t struggle went on here at Vicksburg, the northern Missourians realized that the southern Missourians were hungry and they would go down in the ravines and call them and bring them food to eat. Uh, to the right is Arkansas's memorial uh, with the sword dividing the north and the south. It also memorializes the Arkansas Ram, a Confederate gunboat. As we ride along, we are passing the Great Redoubt at the Louisiana Memorial. This is the highest point on the battlefield. Next of interest is the Mississippi Memorial with a woman uh, representing history sitting in front and the bronze work on the Mississippi uh, depicts scenes uh, from the siege of Vicksburg. Next, we see the memorial to General John C. Pemberton. The sculptor uh, who did this statue of Pemberton said he tried to put into General Pemberton's posture his feeling of despondency and de dejection when he had to surrender Vicksburg. Next, we see the memorial to Jefferson Davis, erected to his memory by the state of Mississippi. Davis was not a native Mississippian. He was born in Kentucky, but Mississippi claims him as one of her illustrious sons. Davis uh, was Mississippi's United States Senator when Mississippi seceded from the Union. He did not believe in the secession of states, but when Mississippi pulled out, he had to resign his post and come home. He was resting on his plantation at Bryfield, helping Mrs. Davis prune roses in their rose garden when he received a message asking him to head the Confederacy. As stated, Davis didn't want to accept the presidency. He was a graduate of West Point and wanted to fight for the South, but he was finally persuaded to accept the post. We are now back at the Vista Center and have completed the tour of the Vicksburg battlefield. I hope you have enjoyed it, and I thank you for your courteous attention. <laughs> well, well, we'll see if it took this time, and if it didn't, we're going to lunch. <laughs> Well, that'll do it. I think it was long. Should have been done long ago.